Hello, everyone. When I was a psychology student more than 30 years ago, one of my dreams was that I wanted to understand the most complex uh, brain functions, like thinking, reasoning, memory, planning, uh, in terms of the activity that took place in neurons in the brain. And my teachers said, this is too ambitious, this is uh, very, very difficult. Today, things have changed. Neuroscience has become one of the most uh, fastest growing uh, scientific disciplines uh, we have. And uh, many groups are actually now working on the neural mechanisms, on the brain mechanisms of complex phenomena such as, uh, as, uh, as uh, thinking, planning, memory, and so on. Yet, it's very difficult. It's a long way to go. But there are some areas that are easier to understand than others, and one of them is space. So let us step back and ask, what do we know about space? And how important is space for us? And why are we so good at it? Because I would claim we are actually really good at it, knowing where we are all the time. So I want to start with a movie that illustrates this point. How does life deal with space? It navigates. Life forms develop and change over time. Abilities and traits that prove useful for survival are retained across generations through the succession of species from the common ancestor to its progeny. These are the mechanisms of evolution. Natural selection has favored the species with the best ability to navigate. An organism that moves can escape from danger and find shelter. Navigation also allows us to actively find food. The safety of a flock or a suitable mate. Scientists have discovered a navigation system in the brain that is common for mammalian species as diverse as bats, rats, mice, monkeys, and even humans. These discoveries suggest that this positioning system evolved from a common ancestor of mammals or earlier. We all share this system. So where is this navigation system? Well, it's all over the brain, but yet there are some parts of the brain that are more important than others. So here, I've illustrated two of them. In red, there's an area called the hippocampus, which is behind your ears in the medial temporal lobe, under the neocortex. And in blue, there's the entorhinal cortex, another more recently studied area that is heavily connected with the hippocampus. Those two areas are very important. But they are not easy to study in the human brain. Not if you really want to understand what are the neurons doing. You need a resolution of individual neurons to understand how they compute space. So, for that reason, neuroscientists have turned to animals. Because animals have the same ability to find their way, to know where they are. So instead of going to the human brain, with its almost 100 billion neurons, or 10 to the 11th of neurons, you can go down uh, the evolutionary tree, past monkeys, go to rodents, the rat has only 200 million neurons, mouse only about 70 million neurons, or if you want, you can continue even further, all the way down to a nematode, a small worm that neuroscientists often study, which has only 302 neurons. So, Still, be, despite being so different, uh, they have all a nervous system, they have a lot of common, and we can learn a lot from, uh, to, uh, by going to the simpler species. And this is because of evolution. However, we don't want to go too far either. We want to study the cortex, because the cortex is the outer sheet of the brain. This is where we are thinking, planning, and presumably also calculating our way in the environment. So, the cortex looks, as you see in this diagram, quite similar in many species, humans to the right, and then rodents in the middle. And, but um, the rodents, 
is what most scientists have focused on, rats and mice. And that's because they are very good at finding their way. We know a lot from them through a hundred years of study of these animals in laboratories. And they have a cortex and a brain that is wired up very, very similarly to ours. We have much more in our brain, but the wiring diagram and the way the neurons work is very, very similar. So that already in 1971 motivated John O'Keefe at the University College of London to record activity from neurons in the hippocampus of the rat brain while a rat was running around in a box like the one you see here, running back and forth and then a cable connected for the occasion, a cable sending electrical imp uh, picking up electrical impulses from the neurons, sending them to a computer and then being stored and, and analyzed afterwards. So I'll show you what O'Keefe found in 1971. So here we see a box from above, a rat again. We'll start the movie very soon. The rat will be walking around, chasing chocolate pieces because they really like chocolate. And what you now hear are the sounds from one single cell in the hippocampus. So these are the spikes, as you heard in earlier talks, uh, the electrical impulses from one single cell in the hippocampus. And you also see red dots when each, each time the cell is active. So what you see now is that this cell is active only when the rat is in the upper corner of the box. Otherwise, totally silent. And for that reason, because it's active in only one place, O'Keefe called them place cells. And then he found that other cells in the same area of hippocampus were active in other places. So we color-coded them, for example, red, this is boxing from above, red is high rate, blue is low rate, and then uh, he, over the years it became clear that the, uh, many cells in the hippocampus, each of them are active in different places of the, hippo, uh, of the box, and together they form a map of the environment that, uh, that um, then O'Keefe and Nadell in uh, 1978 suggested was actually the basis for our ability to know where we are. It's an internal map in the brain. This was 1978. However, many years have passed, and we learned a lot about these cells. But then, a small change, a uh, step forward happened in 2005. So in 2005, uh, the group I'm working with, we found that there is yet another type of cell, now not in the hippocampus, not in the red area, but in the blue area, the entorhinal cortex, which had almost not been explored at all by that time. So we did a similar experiment. Rat was again walking in the box, seen from above there, chasing chocolates, and we recorded activity from individual cells. And the result is what you see to the bottom right there. You see in a gray trace is where the rat walked over 30 minutes, walked all over the box, and all kinds of paths, no particular direction at all. And then in black on top, you see lots of dots. So each of those dots are where that particular cell was active um, in those 30 minutes. And what you can see is that they are similar to the place cells in the hippocampus that are active at certain locations, but they're active at many locations, and those many locations actually form a pattern, a grid. It's a very, very regular grid that uh, stretches out all over the environment, as you can see I shall try to help you by putting these red lines on top, and you can see that it's actually repeating triangles all over the way. So this is like an internal coordinate system that the brain has. It's not based on squares, it's not a Cartesian system, but it's based on triangles, but that works just as well. So this is a metric, a measurement system that the brain has in order to calculate position all the time. And you can then use computers to feed in activity from many of these cells, and the computer can tell immediately, based on the activity of different such cells, where the rat is, what direction it's going, and uh, what speed it's walking with. So that's very useful if you want to know where you are. So, but why such a pattern? I could say a lot about that, I don't have time for that. But there are some things we need to know. How can, how can actually, I mean, it's amazing that these cells know so exactly where to be active, because they, there's no activity between these dots at all. So how can the cell tell just a three, four centimeters apart? 
Well, there are several ways to do that. You could use landmarks, everything you see around you, and calculate uh, distances and directions, but that's not very accurate. So a much better way to use it, which is the basis of much of our sense of um, position or navigation, is to use our own movement. When we move around in the environment, then our brain records the movement and tells how far have we moved and what direction have we moved. And this can be used also for these cells. So, um, to cut the sh uh, story very, very short, this is what is similar to, or has some analogy with the GPS, because the GPS receives information about distance moved, direction moved, puts that together and calculates a new position and doesn't care about what it looks like, whether it's a tree or a, f a house or a river, doesn't matter. It just adds directions and distances, like a vector calculation. And this is what these cells seem also to do. And for that reason, we also often refer to a GPS as, as an analogy for how they work. I skip this, but uh, one question that still arises, where do these cells get their information about direction and distance? Are they doing all of this on their own? And the answer is no. It turned out then that there are many cells in this system. First, there are directional cells. We call them head direction cells because they really care about the direction that the head is, is facing. And these cells were actually discovered by Jim Rank in the 1980s already, but we then found them in this system. So these are cells that are not position cells or place cells, but are actually they, they don't, are not active at any particular locations, as you can see. But what you can see is that they have directional preferences. So the top one fires only when the rat is going to the left two different times. Or if you record a head direction cell from me, I'm going this direction, cell is very, very, very active. I'm going that direction, no response at all. That direction, no response at all. And then I come back and it's very active again. So it's direction coding cells. So you have direction in the system. And then you have other cells that care about the boundaries of the environment that we found a few years later. So these are active, as you see here, again, the box. Uh, they're active uh, only when the rat or mouse is near a border of the environment, a wall of this box. So they define the local boundaries. Then you have cells that care about, tell about the speed, and you need that. You need direction and speed to calculate position. So what you see here uh, to, in the left part are seven different cells recorded over two minutes. Each have a different color. And then in the background of each, you see a gray trace. The gray trace is the speed of the animal, just going up and down because speed is changing all the time. But what you can see is that the color trace, which is the activity of each neuron, follows very, very closely the speed. So that means that these cells actually monitor speed. There's a kind of speedometer in the system which is also required if you need to put together uh, where you are. And finally, there's another type of cell, um, which uh, is so recent that we haven't published it yet, but uh, it's very, there's a lot of data on it already now. And these cells, they are cells that respond not only to the empty space, but actually to the things that are, the, are in the space, the content of the space. So in these experiments, we put an object, in this case, just a Lego tower, as you see, into the box. And then we, again, see the box from above. Now it's a circular box. And the white ring is the location of the tower. And then the color shows where the cell is active. But what you see now in the bottom row, see, you see multiple objects. In some case, number cell number three has six different objects. And what you see is that these cells encode or are active only at a certain direction and distance away from the object, regardless of where the object is. So these cells actually calculate direction and distance from uh, prominent landmarks or objects in the environment. So that means that you have cells that encode the empty space. So the grids is a, a grid or a measurement system for the empty space. You have direction cells, you have border cells, and now you have cells that also encode your position in relation to local objects, like, for example, the monitors here or the loudspeakers there. So does this exist only in rats and mice? Well, no, that's not the case, because we found them in 2005, 6, 7, 8 uh, in uh, rats and in mice. 
later in mice. So they are in the left part of the diagram. And what you see here is uh, uh, branches from an evolutionary tree for, from mammals. So starting in the bottom left and then going up to top right, and you have humans at the top right. And then you have rodents branching off to the left, as you see, and that's where we found the cells. But what you then see is as you go on the right side to the bottom right, you have bats. And bats are interesting because they are not small rats, they are not small mice, they are totally different, on a totally different branch of the evolutionary tree. And still, they have the same cells, same properties, not only grid cells, they have border cells, they have direction cells, everything. And now, finally, they have been found in monkeys, and then at the top also in humans, because they can be recorded in humans with a, a serious epilepsy, where you have to put similar electrodes into the brain, and you see the same thing. So then, just to wrap up, first let me say now, we have the nuts and the bolts, the building blocks of the sense of the space. But of course, the really interesting question is, how do they work together? And that's a much, much more difficult question. We need to know the activity of many, many neurons at the same time, hundreds of thousands at least. Now techniques are coming where you can record so many cells at the same time. I'll just show you one of them. There are several techniques, but the next movie illustrates how the field uh, of uh, space and the entire neuroscience field is moving into uh, recording from many, many cells, huge amounts of data, where you now can see the relationships between the cells and find out how they work together. So let's see at the this next movie. This has a miniature microscope called a miniscope on its head. There's the a microscope on the head of the animal. To into the mouse's brain to observe the activity of the cells as the mouse navigates its environment. We connect the microscope to a computer using a cable and allow the mouse to explore the box. What we see on the screen now are some hundred neurons at the surface of the brain in the area of the entorhinal cortex. These neurons are labeled with a fluorescent molecule that makes the cells glow when they spark. Within the window that we image now, there are hundreds of grid cells. We are interested in finding out how the capacity to navigate is produced in the brain. To study this, we investigate how cells communicate at the neural network level. The miniscope enables us to study the activity of individual cells, as well as cascades and patterns of activity through the entire network. While the miniscope is a low-resolution microscope, you can use a two-photon microscope to study the cells in detail. Here we see the dendritic spines of the grid cell. Shifting the focal point, we can move through the neural tissue. This imaging tool allows us to investigate volumetric neural networks in greater detail. So this movie just illustrates that we are at the beginning of a journey, and I think in, uh, in a few years we'll have so much data, the challenge will now try to be to analyze them. We have already new tools coming for that too, and to understand, but I think uh, we are exciting times ahead, and then I will just want to finish by showing some of the people working on this. Of course, there are many, many people involved, so thank you very much for the attention.